so it's our great privilege today to have Commander Jeff Coke with us to deliver the 2016 Battle for Australia Commemoration Address. Thank you, Rebecca. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, First, I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people, the traditional custodians of this land on which we are gathered, and I pay my respects to their elders, past and present. I'm honoured to be invited to address you on this National Day of Remembrance. It's a privilege to be able to remember with you today the events of 1942 and early 1943, the period of time when Australians and our allies fought to defeat Japan's plan to force Australian surrender. November and December of 1941 were dark months for Australia. HMAS Sydney and her crew of 645 were lost to the German raiding Cormorant. In the Far East, the British capital ships, Prince of Wales and Repulse were sunk. Hong Kong fell on Christmas Day 1941. Malaya was invaded in December, and despite a fighting withdrawal, by 15 Feb 1942, Singapore was surrendered. This resulted in the imprisonment of 100,000 British, Australian and Indian troops. This series of catastrophic events led to the Australian Prime Minister John Curtin declaring on the 16th of February 1942 the fall of Singapore can only be described as Australia's Dunkirk. The fall of Dunkirk initiated the battle for Britain. The fall of Singapore opened the battle for Australia. He foresaw the impending massive struggle to defend Australia against Japanese military aggression. But in the weeks and months and years ahead, this battle for Australia would be fought over land and at sea, challenging Australia's territorial integrity. Today, I would like to tell the story of Australia's Corvettes. Their service goes hand in hand with the battle for Australia. It's a story of courage over adversity, of Australian ingenuity, and of the incredible efforts of the home front to build 60 Australian-designed ships in dockyards around the country. When war looked imminent in 1938, the Royal Australian Navy realised it urgently needed a fleet of escort ships to guard convoys and keep the sea lanes open. The result was a ship designed by Australians who had never designed ships before, built by Australians who had never built ships before, and manned by Australians, many of whom had never been to sea before. The keel of the first was laid down in February 1940. She was launched in August and commissioned in December, named HMAS Bathurst. Corvettes were soon sliding down the slipways of eight shipyards and commissioned at the rate of one every 28, 26 days. They served in every theatre of the war. They escorted convoys, sank submarines, shot at and sometimes downed planes, swept mines, ferried troops, bombarded enemy shore guns, surveyed uncharted waters, towed damaged ships to safety, and even landed spies. They steamed a total of 11 million kilometers, nearly all of it danger in dangerous waters and often behind enemy lines. In 1942, seven corvettes fought in the Malayan campaign in the waters around Singapore. They were the last Allied ships to leave Singapore when it fell, then the last to leave Java when it fell too. At the same time, others were tackling Japanese, the Japanese across northern Australia. HMAS Deloraine, which had only commissioned eight weeks before, took on a Japanese submarine, the I-124, 80 kilometres west of Darwin and sank it. Only a few short days later, on the 19th of February, she was in Darwin Harbour when Japanese aircraft attacked. By mid-1942, there were 24 corvettes conveying merchant ships around the Australian coast when the Japanese submarines were operating. 
two corvettes, Geelong and Wayala, were in harbour the night war came to Sydney. When three Japanese mini submarines entered harbour, attacked with their torpedoes, and sunk the depot ship Hudable, which is my establishment's namesake. At the end of 1942 and into 1943, corvettes escorted the convoys that were bringing vast quantities of military stores and equipment to the frontline troops fighting in New Guinea. They were through the, fighting through the Owen Stanley Ranges and on the northern coast. Through all of their extensive service, two corvettes were lost in, in collisions at sea. One was sunk by a mine, and only one, HMAS Armadale, was sunk by enemy action. She went down on the 1st of December 1942 off Timor, while taking supplies and reinforcements to the commandos fighting there. Under attack by enemy torpedo bombers and fighters, Armadale was hit by two torpedoes as, as a near miss bomb blew a hole in her side. The captain, Lieutenant Commander David Richards, gave the order to abandon ship. But one man stayed, ordinary seaman Teddy Sheehan. He struggled back to the aft gun, strapped himself in, and fired at the planes which were strafing his shipmates in the water. He poured a stream of shells at the planes and sent one cartwheeling into the sea. Despite wounds from enemy fire, he kept firing as the ship disappeared beneath the waters. Ten crew and 37 soldiers had been killed in that action. 102 men were left in the water. Of those, 52 left on two separate missions to seek help in the ship's motorboat and the patched up whaler. They were eventually rescued by the corvette Kalgoorlie four and nine days later respectively. The men left behind on the rafts were sighted by a Raf Catalina flying boat eight days after the sinking. However, it could not land as the seas were too rough. Food and water was dropped, but despite subsequent searches, those men were never seen again. HMAS Sheehan, a Collins class submarine, and the first of the new patrol boats, HMAS Armadale, were named in recognition for the courage and the ingenuity that characterised the Australian corvettes in the battle for Australia. Although focusing on the service of the corvettes, I cannot finish today without recalling the events of this period, which rightly hold a place of honour in the Australian psyche. Those actions that eventually turned the tide on Japan's plans. We remember the battles of the Coral Sea, the Java Sea, of Sunda Strait, of Milne Bay, and of Bismarck Sea. The actions in New Guinea in the Kokoda Campaign, and the beachheads of Gona, Buna, and Sanananda, and the Guadalcanal Campaign. In 1943, Japan's unconditional surrender was still far off. But the certainty that victory would come had replaced the fears of early 1942. John Curtin's worst concerns after Singapore fell had not been realised. Japan had first been checked and then defeated by land, sea and air north of Australia. What do we owe this heroic generation of young Australians and our allies? who died defending this country in 1942 and who are now passing into history. We honour the courage and tenacity of those who died fighting in the jungles of New Guinea. We remember with gratitude the loyalty and skill of the Papuan men who played a vital role in supporting the troops, especially the sick and wounded. We remember those in the ships sunk off our shores, and the faithful sailors who stuck to their guns and died fighting like Teddy Sheehan. We remember the brave airmen who fought and died in the skies of the Pacific. We remember the lonely coast watchers across the Southwest Pacific who kept up a vigil for months and years and tapped out their vital warnings of Japanese activity. We remember the Allied merchant navies who bought the troops their lifeblood and paid for it with their own. 
and we rem remember and honour the women, women and men who made their contribution on the home front, remaining strong and steadfast despite hardship and the loss of life and the threat of invasion. We owe them all our remembrance and gratitude on this day and every day. Their legacy to us is our lifelong prosperity, liberty and peace. Today's last post bugle sounds for them all, lest we forget.